sets of coefficients which are mostly zero or near zero. So, sorry, this should be an alpha, not an A. So the zero norm of alpha I, that's the number of non-zero entries in alpha I should be small. That says that in representing every data point, I'm going to use, I want to use only a small number of the dictionary elements. If I can do that, you know, in a certain sense, uh, I've compressed my data because instead of it requiring capital D numbers to encode that vector, I'm going to need only a number of numbers which is equal, which is no larger than K. Okay, so small compared to D? I would like K small compared to M and perhaps M, in practice M turns out to be comparable to D in what people usually do, so, but uh, you know, perhaps you know, M could be much smaller than capital D, or it could even be larger, but then uh, you, know, you want K really small. Now there is a, there is a problem here, uh, there are many problems actually with the statement of this problem. Uh, you know, for example, take M really large. Maybe I can take M as large as M. And, uh, and then you know, I can take my dictionary to be equal to my data, and then I get uh, only one non-zero alpha i, and so I get k equal to one. So this problem actually doesn't make any sense as stated. I buy people solve this every time, uh, very often, and I don't understand what that means because the problem doesn't make sense. So, uh, so you know, there are problems here. So clearly you have to put some restrictions on m and perhaps on k and perhaps on epsilon. So for example, there, there are lots of relationships. If you make m larger, probably you can make epsilon smaller and or k smaller. So what are the relationships between the choices of epsilon, k, and m? Should I fix m and derive the best epsilon and k, or maybe fix epsilon and derive the others? Very unclear. And moreover, you know, I don't really care about compressing the excise. I can sort of do it trivially if I don't put restrictions on, on m, epsilon, and k, or, or an m, uh, that would be enough. But what I'm interested in is really compressing the data. So what I wanna say is that I have some training data today in my database, but I want to be able to compress the data that I'm gonna collect tomorrow. And so it's really crucial, or at least one way of making this problem well posed and meaningful, is to say, well, the excise are sample from a probability measure. I see n samples today, that's my database today. I'm gonna to draw more samples tomorrow, and tomorrow I want to achieve a certain performance in terms of accuracy, epsilon, and sparsity k. So that's the game that we're going to play. So the is going to be time invariant. It will be time invariant, and I want, to pro I want to say, if I have a training set which is reasonable today, I'm gonna to do this well, in terms of epsilon and k tomorrow, on tomorrow's data, and all the data in the future. And uh, of course in harmonic analysis we're very much used to problems of this type. Think, think of your data as functions in a function space. We have, we have become very good for many function spaces at constructing dictionaries for which we can tell you very, very well which accuracy you get with which sparsity. That's a lot of harmonic analysis. Uh, you know, for example, if you pick uh, you know, basal spaces and these are wavelets, we can tell you exactly the trade-offs between M, Epsilon, and K, depending on the index of the basal space. For those of you uh, who know what I'm talking about, I hope you appreciate that this is the same problem, but where you don't have a model for the function space. You just sample functions, you see a million of them, and then you want to construct, say, wavelets automatically. You want the algorithm to construct them. All right, so uh, of course the key here is that to attack this problem we're going to assume that mu is special. So it supports a near low dimensional set, or perhaps a, a manifold of dimension small d. This is a small d, small compared to the large d up there where the data lived. So what do people do to attack these problems? They, they I mean, there are many, many approaches. So since the paper by Field, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, follow-up papers by Dono and Michelad, uh, Basis Pursuit, and uh, sort of the generalization. This set of problems received a lot of attention because so finding good dictionaries actually led to state-of-art algorithms in a lot of signal processing tasks, denoising, in-painting, uh, super-resolution, you name it. And so if you have a do the, the motto has become, if you have a really good dictionary, you can solve these problems really, really well. And, um, um, and so there are many, many approaches, more than can I review, but just to give you a flavor of how this got started and, and uh, some of the algorithms that are up there. So you, you start with the following. You say, if I have a dictionary, 
and I want to compress a point x onto that dictionary, how do I do that? What's my encoding map? Well, I care about two things, approximating my point well and having a sparse set of coefficients. Notice here that there is place sparsity, the number of non-zero coefficients, with something weaker, the L1 norm of the coefficients, that's just the sum of the absolute values. Turns out that these two things are quite related, but this which is dictated both by computational reasons, now the problem becomes convex, this is convex, this is convex, and, uh, and so this can actually be solved reasonably. Uh, but also it turns out that many times, or under suitable assumptions, I should say, on the data and the dictionary, solving this problem actually leads a solution of the L0 problem, where you have 0 over here. And that was actually the beginning of uh, things that today are called compressed sensing or sparse representations. But so if you look at this functional, you want to minimize over all choices of coefficients this functional. So if you minimize this, this is small, that is small, which means you approximate x well and you get a sparse set of coefficients, at least in the L1 sense. The problem is convex, you can solve it reasonably fast. A byte I wouldn't say fast, but not everybody would agree with me on that statement. <laughs> so there's been a huge amount of work just to try to solve this problem more and more efficiently in the past 10, 15 years. So Okay, so if you have, this is if you have a dictionary and you want to encode x. This gives you the alphas for encoding x, the small number of non-zero coefficients for encoding x. Then, uh, if you don't know phi, you might say, well, I see data and I can write a functional where for every data point I try to compress it and I get a certain set of alphas and a certain cost. And then I want to try to minimize a functional like this, my average cost in encoding the data. And so you end up with problems that have these four, where you now search through dictionaries, you don't minimize just over coefficients, but now you don't know the dictionary, so you want to minimize over dictionaries, over sets of coefficients onto that dictionary, and you minimize a functional, which is just as two terms, an approximation term, this is just the vectorized version of this over all the axes that you have, so you stack your axes in the matrix capital X, and alpha is now a matrix of coefficients, one set of coefficients for every x, and this is the Frobenius norm, which after you expand it out is just the sum of these norms, sum for each of the x's in your data. And then, so you want to approximate all of your data points well by some linear combination of dictionary elements, and you want, to, the sparse, you want sparsity of the coefficients, this 1, 1, this is not quite standard notation, is simply the sum of the absolute values of the matrix of coefficients. So it's just, if this is small, if lots of coefficients in the, in, are, are small in absolute okay. value. Of the, entries. Of the entries of the matrix, of all the entries. So it's really the one norm of alpha thought of as a vector. So uh, this problem, unfortunately, is very, very hard. So you typically cannot search all dictionaries, otherwise this is completely ill-posed. So you restrict your set of dictionaries to some convex set. For example, you ask that the norm of the vectors in your dictionary are less than or equal to 1. So this is now convex. This is, a, this is our k by n, so it's convex. So the domain is convex, but it's extremely high dimensional. This is the set of all possible choices of dictionaries. It's just very, very high dimensional. So the domain is convex. The functional, unfortunately, is not convex. So if you fix alpha, well, if you fix phi, it's the problem we had before, just vectorized, so it's convex. If you fix alpha, it's also convex. But if you let both terms, both alpha and phi be unknown, the whole problem is not convex anymore. So what do you do? Well, most of the algorithms out there, and this is just a short list of uh, probably 50, 60 papers that are there trying to do this, uh, you alternate. You say, you fix phi, you minimize in alpha. You fix the alphas, you minimize in phi. And, and when you do this, you take gradient steps, and taking gradient steps in the space of dictionaries is really, really expensive. So these algorithms, I wouldn't claim, are fast. Uh, but there are very clever implementation of this. I think the state of the art is in this paper by Maral, Bach, Pons, and Sapir, back, I think, in 2009 or 10. And uh, they have a nice multi-threaded C++ implementation for this. Our, I want to make another connection for these problems to quantization. Um, because uh, that's standard when you want to compress, you quantize your space. So you could say, well, I'm going to, cons uh, and probably the, uh, this, the most classical uh, example of quantization is by k-means. So the goal here is the following. You have your data, you are going to replace each data point by a template, if you want. 
and you allow yourself to have a small number of templates, capital K, and uh, you want to minimize some distortion. In this case, you want to say, I want to minimize the distance between Xi and the, the template that is going to replace it. I measure my approximation error maybe in L2. So I'm going to choose my templates in order to minimize this quantity. Clearly, the more templates I have, the smaller I can make this number. And again, this problem is not, uh, has been studied for a very long time. For example, for clustering, you can think that these are cluster centers and the Xi is assigned to a fixed template are the points in that cluster. All right. And right now we have reasonable algorithms for, for doing this, uh, like k-means plus plus. There is a generalization to this where instead of replacing a point, every data point, by a template, you replace it, each point by its projection on a low-dimensional plane. This is back to the figure at the beginning where you might say, well, my, my data maybe lies on the union of a small number of planes, of low-dimensional planes. So you could ask, instead of exchanging each point by a template point, you replace each point by a projected point onto an unknown set of subspaces. And then you look for a set of subspaces, capital K of them, of dimension that you usually fix a priori, maybe D, small d. And, uh, and that's an encoding too, because now you have replaced each point by a low dimensional projection of each of them. So this is cheaper to encode than the original point because this is a low dimensional vector. And uh, this is sometimes called the K-flat problem. It's solved by alternating algorithms like K-means, but unfortunately these algorithms unlike k-means plus plus, are not guaranteed to converge to a global minimum. They typically converge to local minima, and there are plenty, plenty, plenty of local minima, and these local minima are not all equivalent in terms of the, on the cost. And so this is, uh, as, uh, as of today, uh, pretty much a nightmare to, to solve. All right, so again, then, yes? And then <clears throat> the minimum that, 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 that you find depends on the solution, of the first solution with which you try to minimize. Yes, and now in k-means, it is now the case that there are provably good initializations. Mm. So there are pre-processing, and this part, this is part of this k plus k means k, k, ah, k means plus plus. Did I say that right? Uh, algorithm where you do a clever initialization, where clever is not as usual. You know, you have your own recipe and I have my own, but it's probably a clever initialization point so that when you start then uh, shifting the centers around and doing essentially an EM type of algorithm, you actually converge to a probably good solution. That's kind of amazing that you actually can prove something about good initialization. That doesn't happen often. But we don't have any such thing for K-flats. It's an open problem. Many people are very interested in this, of course, but it's, uh, it seems much harder than K-means. And even K-means plus plus, it took many, many years uh, to, to figure that out. Okay. And of course, there are many questions here. How do you pick the number of centers? How do you pick the number of planes? How do you pick the dimension of the planes? Uh, the, the, there is not much known about this. I've some recent work uh, by Lorenzo Rosasco and his collaborators, uh, uh, Kanas and, uh, and Tommy Podge at MIT answer some of these questions, how to choose capital K and uh, in, a, in a nice principled way. So oftentimes when these algorithms are run, no hypothesis is made on the data. That's why sometimes it's hard to prove things. We are going to make assumptions about low intrinsic dimensionality of the data. In which form? Well, uh, we're going to assume that the data lies in a tube around a low dimensional manifold. Why do we do this? Well, so first of all, as I tried to convince the attendants yesterday, uh, we, can measure, we can go and measure the intrinsic dimensionality of data for many data sets and that, low intrinsic dimensionality, that intrinsic dimensionality is often very low. So sometimes the data does lie on a low dimensional set that is as nice as a manifold, sometimes it does not. So it, it, it might not for different reasons. Maybe the data did, uh, if it was perfectly clean, with no noise, it would lie on a low dimensional manifold, but then there is noise that pushes it out. That's sort of a setup that I described yesterday when I described multi-scale SVD. Or per perhaps the data is intrinsically low dimensional, but does not lie on a smooth manifold. And so we're gonna relax the manifold assumption to include both the case of noise and the case where we're wrong about assuming that there is a manifold by saying simply that the data lies in a tube of a certain radius sigma around a low dimensional manifold. Okay, so the data could be on a manifold plus noise, or it could be a crazy low dimensional setting there that we don't know how to characterize, but it lies inside that tube. 
And then I'm going to discuss a very fast construction that completely solves the dictionary learning problem. And I'm going to write down uh, the, the guarantees. And I'm going to hopefully, uh, I'm going to spend quite some time on this. I apologize if it looks messy, but I'm going to go suitably slowly on this one because it's, a, it's our uh, key result. And I'm going to uh, give an answer to the dictionary learning problem under this assumption in the following way. So we have this sigma, which is the radius of a tube, and we're going to fix an accuracy, epsilon. This is how well I want to approximate my data when I do my dictionary learning reconstruction. And epsilon has to be larger than sigma. Why? Because I don't know what's happening inside the tube. It's either noise or it could be that uh, you know, the data is a really weird structure. So my accuracy is going to be always larger than the radius of that tube. And then I'm going to promise you the following. I'm going to promise that if today you have seen n data points and n is larger than epsilon to the minus 1 plus d over 2, yes, so if epsilon becomes smaller, n becomes larger, 